Okay, good morning, everyone. Hello, hello. I'm Dan Gorodnik, Chair of the City Planning Commission, Director of the Department of City Planning. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's special review session and public hearing. Today's date is October 26, uh, 2022. I'd like to note that we have been joined uh, today by Commissioners Knuckles, Benjamin, Bozorg, Osorio, Cerullo, Crowell, Dweck, Gold, Kermani, and Rampershad. Welcome to all of you. Good to see you all. Um, we're going to begin with, as we noted uh, on Monday, a very quick special review session uh, to vote on a city council modification uh, to change the proposed zoning district uh, for residential development uh, located in Gowanus. That's the 9th Street rezoning. Uh, once that concludes, we will end our special meeting and we will move on to the public hearing uh, where uh, New Yorkers will have the opportunity to testify on a variety of projects. Uh, that seek to create new housing, businesses, and even an emergency service location uh, in various parts of New York City. Uh, these projects include the relocation of an FDNY EMS station to West 29th Street in Hudson Yards in West Chelsea. Um, we'll also have a hearing on a proposal for approximately 80 homes with up upgrades to a supermarket uh, that has long served the Lefrak uh, City community. Um, located less than a mile from Flushing Meadows Corona Park. Uh, that's at 9727 57th Avenue. Uh, and uh, also at 5802 Northern Boulevard, uh, a proposal for a new auto uh, showroom. Uh, before we start, I want to again plug the Department of City Planning's second remote public session uh, tomorrow. Uh, on Mayor Adams' City of Yes initiatives. That will be tomorrow at 7 o'clock. The session will include a detailed presentation and a Q&A. Uh, and I encourage everyone to get involved, make their voices heard. Again, we're shaping these proposals now. This is a good and important time for people to share their thoughts and insights and help us uh, make these the most complete that they possibly can be. You can register at nyc.gov forward slash engage. So with that, as a way of introduction, uh, we will start the special review session uh, and then move on to today's votes and public hearings. So, Ryan, Certainly. good morning. Good floor morning. is yours. Uh, so this is a uh, special review session of the New York City Planning Commission for Wednesday, October 26, 2022. The time is 10.03 a.m. and a quorum is present in the hearing room at 120 Broadway. The first and only item on our agenda is the City Council Modification Scope Determination for the 9th Avenue rezoning, uh, a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 6. This was discussed at Monday's review session, uh, but I will briefly recap. The council proposes to modify the zoning map amendment such that the proposed zoning would be an MX M1 4 R6B. This was in opposition to the, uh, the original proposal of an M14 R7A. The zoning text amendment is likewise amended to reflect the modified zoning district and to add the deep affordability option to the MIH uh, options so that both option one and the deep affordability option will apply. Uh, staff believe that this uh, modification is within scope. Great, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, are there questions? Further comments? Obviously, we discussed this on Monday. Okay. Um, all right. So seeing none, uh, what we do in these circumstances, this is a scope determination, so I will seek assent by a voice vote here uh, to send a letter to the council that these modifications are, in fact, within scope. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. I'd like to ask for assent by voice vote uh, to send a letter to the council that the modifications here are within scope. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Okay, thank you very much, Ryan. And I believe that is the end of our uh, special review session. Is that correct? That's true. Yes. Great, okay. Then uh, we are going to move on to the next meeting of the day, which is our public meeting. Uh, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to you. Sarah, go ahead. Good morning. This is a City Planning Commission public meeting held remotely through the NYC Engage portal and in person in the CPC hearing room, 120 Broadway, Lower Concourse. 
Today is Wednesday, October 26, 2022. I will now call the roll. Chair Garodnik. Here. Vice Chair Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Benjamin. Here. Commissioner Bozark. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner Crowell. Here. Commissioner Dewick. Here. Commissioner Gold. Here. Commissioner Goodrich is absent. Commissioner Kermani. Here. Commissioner uh, Marin. Commissioner Osario. Here. Commissioner Rampershaw. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes as a special public meeting of Tuesday, October 11th, 2022. Great. Thank you very much. On the minutes, I make a motion to approve. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Minutes are approved. Scheduling. Calendar numbers one through three. We have resolution for adoption scheduling Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, for a public hearing to be held in person in the CPC hearing room, 120 Broadway, and remotely through the NYC Engage portal. Great. Thank you very much. On the resolutions, I again make a motion to approve. Uh, seek a second. Second. It's been seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page six. Borough Staten Island, calendar number four, Clove Road, Emerson Drive, CD2 N2201860, ZAR, and the matter of an application for the grant of authorization concerning Clove Road, Emerson Drive. For the adoption on calendar number four, Chair Garadnik. Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Aye. Commissioner Benjamin. Aye. Commissioner Bozark. Aye. Commissioner Cerullo. Aye. Commissioner Cowell. Aye. Commissioner Dewick. Aye. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Commissioner Kermani. Aye. Commissioner Osorio. Aye. Commissioner Rampershot. Aye. Calendar number four has been adopted. Borough Staten Island, calendar numbers five, six, seven, and eight. Calendar number five, CD2 N230038 ZCR, 1221 Forest Hill Road. Calendar number six, CD3 N220317 RCR, 107 Seguin Avenue. Calendar number seven, CD3 N220351 RCR, 635 Darlington Avenue. Calendar number eight, CD3 N220417 uh, RCR 52 uh, Nestle Street. And the matter of applications for the grant of certifications concerning 12 uh, 21 Forest Hill Road, 107 Seguin Avenue, 635 Darlington Avenue, and 52 uh, Nestle Street. For the adoption on calendar numbers 5, 6, 7, and 8, Chair Grodnick. Aye. Vice Chair Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Benjamin. Aye. Commissioner Bozard. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner Crowell. Yes. Commissioner Dewick. Yes. Commissioner Gold. Yes. Commissioner Kamani. Yes. Commissioner Osorio. Yes. Commissioner Rampershad. Yes. Calendar numbers five, six, seven, and eight have been adopted. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing section on page eight. Great, thank you very much. Um, again, we ask those who are testif testifying today to limit remarks to three minutes. Um, and uh, with that, I'm gonna ask the calendar officer to call the first item on our agenda today. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number nine, block 675 EMS, number seven relocation, CD4, C220468, PCM. Public hearing in the matter of an application for site selection and acquisition concerning block 675 EMS, number seven relocation. Great, thank you. And we're gonna start with the applicant team. They are remote. Uh, Modern technology allows for, for this here, for us to be present and them to be remote. These are from our sister agencies, DCAS, FDNY. Um, let me call up Chris Grove, Stephanie Williams, Cassandra Richard, Jeremy Brooks, uh, and Laura Ringelheim. Uh, and whenever you are ready, uh, the applicant team has 10 minutes. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeremy Brooks. I am the uh, Fire Department Assistant Commissioner of Facilities Management. I am joined today with uh, Executive Deputy Commissioner Laura Ringelheim. Uh, we will be presenting on the new uh, relocation of EMS Station 7. Uh, next slide. Did the slide change? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Let's Sorry. give this a second. Hang on. There they go. Thank you. We're with you now. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, in 1996, the city's emergency medical service function was merged with the New York City Fire Department. It was formerly with the Health and Hospital Corporation. One of the merger's goals was to increase the number of EMS support throughout the city. 
By increasing the number of stations, we would be able to reduce ambulance out of service times and keep those larger units available in their response areas. Unfortunately, in the spring of 2010, St. Vincent's, Vincent's Hospital closed. This required the agency to assume management of the five ambulance units, 13 eight hour tours per day, which the hospital had placed in the city's emergency 911 system. Next slide. Thank you. Unfortunately, the agency's nearest EMS station facility, Station A, at Bellevue Hospital, is located on First Avenue and East 28th Street. This led to a logistical and operational issue for the agency due to the distances which ambulances units would need to travel back and forth to be reassigned. So the agency worked with OMB and DCAS to identify and establish a suitable location on Manhattan's west side to support the EMS station's need. A privately owned parcel at 512 West 23rd Street was selected to serve as a temporary location for EMS Station 7 until a final site was identified, acquired, and brought online. Next slide. So what this slide shows is a graph of the um, response in the area and how many units there are covering. And the community board and the number of incidents that everybody could see how it's a very active station. Next slide. This graph shows the number of calls that the uh, station seven deals with on in community board four. As you can see, there's thousands of calls each month and it is a very busy area as it is a growing population. Next slide. Since a, uh, EMS station opened, the agency has worked to address the operational issues and quality of life concerns brought forward by local officials, area residents, and community board four. At the same time, the agency has continued to work with OMB and DCAS to move this important emergency response facility to a more permanent location as it's in a temporary space. However, over the past decade, this has proved problematic due to the city's overall fiscal condition, the lack of any viable city-owned space in the area of the borough, but also the almost white-hot state of the private real estate and construction development markets on Manhattan's far west side. Next slide, please. For the past few years, and this was delayed by the COVID pandemic, the agency again with OMB and DCAS worked to secure a permanent site for Station 7 as part of a larger development project located at 6 13 West 29th Street. With the support of the property owner, Douglas Development, the city plans to utilize an approximately 18,500 square foot vacant parcel at the West 29th Street site to create a permanent facility for Station, station 7. As such, the agency and DCAS have developed a site selection acquisition, ULOP action to move this important project forward. Next slide, please. Thank you. With funding support with, from OMB, the agency has worked with the Department of Design and Construction and plans to build a three-story, approximately 18,000 square foot facility on the proposed site. This proposed facility will have off-street parking for nine ambulances, ambulance equipment storage, administration, administrative areas, mechanical technology, technology sec, uh, security spaces, ambulance staff decontamination, male-female locker rooms, bathrooms, various cr crew spaces, kitchens, pantry, dining room, gym, ready room, nursing, mother station, bicycle storage area, training area, et cetera, and 18 off-street parking spaces for the staff's personal vehicles. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the proposed location of the new EMS station will be on West 29th Street, will create a permanent site for the EMS operations of Manhattan's Far West Side, provide EMS operations with greater operational and logistical capabilities, alleviate quality of life issues on West 23rd Street, provide the residents of Manhattan Community Board 4 with an enhanced level of emergency medical services. As such, we respectfully request the Commission support this proposed action. Next slide. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you uh, for uh, your presence here today. And um, uh, before I go to commissioners for uh, additional questions, let me just note here, and maybe you can just explain to us the, the big picture dynamic of where we will be if this is approved here for both acquisition and site selection. Um, after that approval, 
there is a period of time before which this project actually would come to be. Is that correct? That is correct. The current location. Can you explain that dynamic to us? Of course. So um, the site selection was done and the current location will be used as the Amtrak staging area for the proposed gateway tunnel project. For how long? They are, right now they are saying no longer than 10 years. Okay, so what will, once you have, uh, once this site is acquired, then there will be a separate negotiation between the city and Amtrak to allow for an easement on that site, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, Mr. Buzzard. Hi, thank you for the presentation and for your service also. Um, I was just curious if you could talk to us a little bit about how the um, needs for the number of vehicles in the space are determined by FDNY, um, and if there's any concern about I know there's been concerns raised by the community board and others about whether um, the needs 10 years from now and potentially even longer if the gateway project is delayed further, which is very much always a possibility, um, whether, so explaining how the needs are estimated and if there's any concern from the FDNY about whether um, the needs may change 10 years from now when this project will actually come start. No, of course, uh, that's a great question. So the current EMS station seven right now houses 70 members. The new EMS station seven will have enough space for 148 members. So we are looking to, we, so we have enough space in the building to basically double the size of the members in the, for that area. So we are planning for growth. And is there any concern around whether future growth, housing development, other types of development in the area may change those needs 10, 10 years from now? Um, we feel like uh, doubling the size of the station is a very large number to accommodate growth in the area. Okay, okay. Commissioner Benjamin. Yes, can you share with us during the next 10 years, what is the plan for this station that is currently on 23rd Street. Will it stay there? How long will it stay there? How will you accommodate the growth over the next 10 or 12 years? Well, our plan is to remain at the 23rd Street station until we can move to, to the uh, new station. Um, we are hoping that we will be less than 10 years. And if there is continued growth in the area, then we will make uh, accommodations in the existing space to accommodate more members. How many tours could you accommodate at the 23rd Street location? Well, it's three tours. Three tours are the set number of right. tours because it's but broken out by hours. How many personnel can you accommodate with lockers and bathrooms and changing well, we out? Yeah, so we could go ambulance. to the um, station and uh, we could have our architects. Uh, if we see a large growth in the area, we can have our architects do a, a spatial analysis to see how much space we can accommodate. Usually we do this at a lot of our buildings to see uh, as areas change to see how, what we can encompass in those small spaces. Okay, back to you, Commissioner Buzzer. Um, um, I just want to be clear. I fully support this project. I think it's great. I just think it's needed to come online sooner than is projected. I know that's not in your hands personally. I do wonder, is there anyone from DCAS here to answer questions? Because I, I, I yes, think my question are, is more for DCAS. They are here. Yeah. Okay. Because the question I have is whether um, DCAS or the city has been actively looking for altern alternative sites to offer Amtrak for staging so that the project could come online faster. Um, given the need that's been expressed. Great, let's uh, see if we can pull up uh, either uh, Chris Grove or uh, uh, Laura Ringelheim for that one. Hi, uh, good morning, Chair uh, Grodnick and commissioners. Um, we had been looking, DCAS had been looking, this was a, a long project of, of site searching for, for many years before we uh, were even presented with the opportunity to, to take this site. Um, 
I, I believe that, we, you know, if given the, the, that this acquisition hasn't happened and that talks with Amtrak are, are ongoing, um, we're, we're waiting to see after the acquisition happens, what we can do uh, in terms of either, you know, shortening the timeline or looking for other temporary space, um, but it is a very difficult need to meet and we had not been successful in binding a space for many years. Okay, thank you. I guess I'll just double down on expressing that I, I think it's clearly a need today. Um, appreciate the borough president even waiving um, their office's review time so that this could move, the acquisition can move as fast as possible. Um, and just really hope that that conversation remains active and that we try to find a solution, especially in a world where the gateway development may face even future further delays um, that could put this at risk even longer than the 10 years. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Rampershad and then Commissioner Osorio. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, say this eight years, 10 years, whatever it may be, after you take acquisition of the property, how long do you estimate construction to take place? Because is it going to be 18 months? And if so, well, during the construction, you'll still be occupying the uh, 23rd Street station during that time? Correct. We would occupy the station until we can move. Um, construction is probably between 20 to 36 months. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first question is um, the the proposed site is, is, as you know, within the 100-year floodplain, the current 100-year floodplain, and it's expected to increase its vulnerability into the future, even with 2020 projections. It, can you explain a little bit sort of what is the city policy to locate EMS uh, stations in terms of coastal inundation, and and what are some of the provisions that you have in that you will have in place to secure the site? Well, when we build buildings in flood zones, now we all, all are built to a uh, hundred or five year five hundred year uh, flood levels. So, which means all utilities and all functions are above that height. If it is uh, ten feet, fifteen feet, so items are sometimes on second floors. Anything critical is outside the floodplain. So that's something we do now with all our buildings that are built in flood zones. Um, what was the other part of the question? I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. No, that was that was uh, the first one. I think that 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 answers the the component of the question that is about actual the building component of it. But moving into the second question and to address vehicles, uh, it sounds like you have a strong commitment to well on one end in response to the community board's request to air quality improvements, um, a builder's uh, paving plan in terms of permeability and so forth. But very specifically, you mentioned the intent to have electric charging stations for the vehicles. How will that relate to the inundation uh, vulnerability that you just discussed? So if um, that is a question that as we go through the uh, development of the project, we will have to see where we can locate the electric chargers that are that don't get affected if there is uh, inundation. One of the things we've done at some of our buildings, we've built flood walls outside the buildings as, as protective barriers. So if there are items that we cannot say raise, we at least have the flood walls to uh, reduce any storm surge that may occur. But as the design of the project goes through, we will get a better determination on what the flood zone will be in, you know, eight years, and where are the options that we can uh, relocate possibly electric charging stations. Thank you for your response. I, I just would encourage you to start thinking about these sooner rather than later, just because of you know the character of the of the facility in question, but also the imminent vulnerability to flooding that we see on the map. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions, comments? Okay, great. Uh, so to the applicant team, thank you very much uh, for your time and certainly for your service to the city. We appreciate you very much. Um, and we're going to move on to the uh, public uh, testimony portion of the hearing. So we will excuse you all. And I'm going to move on to three members of the public who have signed on uh, to testify remotely signed up to testify. First is Jessica Chait, to be followed by Jesse Bodine and Carrie Keenan. So um, when Jessica Chait is ready, you can go right ahead. The floor is yours for three minutes.
Great. Can you all hear me? We can. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Chair Gronick and Commissioners. Uh, I'm Jessica Chate, the uh, co-chair of our Chelsea Land Use and First Vice Chair of Community Board 4. And at our September full board meeting of Community Board 4, we voted to approve this ULERP for site acquisition and selection for the construction of a permanent station for the EMS number seven station at 613 West 29th Street on the condition that an immediate solution to the current temporary outdoor station at West 23rd Street be secured. Uh, since for a bit of history, since the relocation more than 10 years ago of the FDNY station at 50, at, excuse me, 23rd Street, uh, following the closure of St. Vincent's Hospital, MCB4 has been vocal that a suitable indoor permanent location that can also support the growing needs that uh, Commissioner Benjamin spoke about uh, needs of the area be identified was essential. For a bit more history, in 2016 and 17, MCB4 worked with the Department of City Planning to develop a rezoning framework for Block 675, which included accommodating needed public facilities and infrastructure, such as this EMS station. And in 2018, as part of the rezoning ULERP for that block, we obtained a written, written commitment from Douglaston Development to provide the land for this station as part of their development at 601 West 29th Street the location being discussed today. At that time, MCB4 was then made aware of this proposed site uh, being discussed for construction staging for the Hudson River Tunnel project as part of the larger gateway project. And therefore, at the same time of rezoning, we collaborated with the Port Authority, then a lead stakeholder in Gateway, to secure yet another temporary location. Uh, following various tours, locations, site selections, et cetera, it was then determined uh, that the project would not go through, as you may remember, the governor of New Jersey pulled out of the Gateway Project and all planning came to a halt. It was during this time that, uh, that FDNY began per further pursuing the development and staging uh, designs of this uh, current proposed station. Um, but without a recognition or consideration of what would happen when when Amtrak, excuse me, needed to use the property for this long duration. So while we are comfortable and encouraged by the design, we do ask FDNY to further commit to a thorough emissions plan, as was mentioned just a minute ago, and ensuring the facility will be built in consideration of future needs like electric charging. But additionally, the fact that EMS and FDNY have simply ignored the fact that this is now 12 or 15 years away from reality is simply unacceptable. So as proposed, um, uh, we're very we're comfortable with this location for the purposes of the ULERP, but we ask the city, really FDNY and DCAS, to work with us and Amtrak uh, to ensure a more suitable, immediate solution can be found to address the growing needs of EMS on, in our district. Great, thank you very much. And let me note for the uh, commissioners present, uh, since uh, many of us are new and we are also new in this format, uh, for members of the public testifying, um, if you have questions for them, please do raise your hand toward the end of their, their time and I will recognize you otherwise. If I don't have questions myself, I'm just gonna move on to the next person. So just for the ease of, uh, of uh, the hearing moving along, but Commissioner Osorio, I'll call on you first. Thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate your comments in the letter and in your presentation about the strong commitment from the FDNY regarding uh, clean air uh, in a, a emission with to an, a, the their emission plan, but also uh, the response or their commitment to respond to your request for a building uh, builder's paving plan. I was wondering if you can if you've received uh, any details from them in terms of what that commitment means. Have they shared any information in terms of how they plan to proceed in that regard? I don't believe we received any specifics other than uh, a verbal commitment that they are, uh, you know, that one, well, I should say that one, that all FDM, FDNY EMS stations are being designed uh, with this in mind and that previous, that there's sort of a model of uh, development, construction that they follow and that this is being considered uh, to reduce emissions. Um, there, as you heard just a minute ago from, from the representative, that they will be looking into how to deal with electric charging, et cetera. Uh, I, I think that is a little shy of a firm commitment, but at least is a recognition that this does need to be accommodated or that we're requesting it needs to be accommodated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. 
Um, thank you, Ms. Chait. We appreciate your testimony today. We're going to move on uh, to Jesse Bodine, followed by Carrie Keenan. Whenever Jesse Bodine is here and ready, you can go right ahead. You have three minutes. Welcome. Do you hear me now? <laughs> we can hear you. Hi, sorry about that. I'm actually I'm just here as a I was ba back up in case um, uh, Jessica was not able to uh, get on. So I'm, I'll do, hand back my time. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move on to Carrie Keenan. Okay, um, with that, I'm gonna do a final call for any members of the public wishing to testify on this item. Uh, the block 675 EMS number seven uh, relocation. Seeing none, I, we will close the hearing on this item. Thanks everybody who was here to testify. We'll ask the calendar officer to call the second public hearing item of the day. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers 10 and 11, 5802 Northern Boulevard rezoning, CD2, calendar number 10, C210389 ZMQ, calendar number 11, N210390 ZRQ, public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning maps and zoning text amendments concerning 5802 Northern Boulevard rezoning. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me note we have an applicant team. Chair, excuse me, I'm recused in this matter. Commissioner Rampershad is recused. Thank you very much. Uh, let me... Um, Note, we're joined by uh, Frank St. Jacques, Nellie Hennessy, Michael Naclerio, Joseph Vol Voltaggio, and John Starks. Good to have you all here. Welcome. Whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and you have uh, 10 minutes. All these in-person things. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, Good morning, Chair Garodnik and Commissioners. My name is Frank St. Jacques. I'm an associate with Ackerman LLP and we're land use counsel for the project. Um, as noted, I'm joined by several members of the project team, including the applicant and owners of the site. Um, we have uh, Michael Naclerio uh, and uh, Joe Valtaggio is, is, is running late, so he's not up here. Uh, and their, their teammate, John Starks. Also the project architect, uh, Nellie Hennessy, is, is joining us. After our brief presentation, uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, so the site, uh, 5802 Northern Boulevard, is located on the south side of Northern Boulevard between 58th Street and 60th Street in Community District 2, Queens. As shown on the zoning map, the site and the surrounding area are located primarily within an R5 zoning district that was mapped in 1961. There are M11 zoning districts established in 1961 and 1966 map to the west and east of the R5 zoning district. The R5 zone portion of Northern Boulevard where the development site is located is occupied almost entirely by non-conforming commercial uh, uses which are shown here in red and semi-industrial and industrial uses which are shown here in purple. Many are automobile related uses including sales and repairs. Conforming residential use uh, is generally located in the mid block beyond Northern Boulevard uh, the Northern Boulevard block fronts, but there are also some non-conforming industrial uses within these mid-block areas. Conforming residential uses are generally two and three-story, one and two-family homes and multi-family walk-up buildings. And you can see that surrounding context in this aerial photograph. Again, along Northern Boulevard, despite the R5 zoning, you can see that it is entirely non-residential with residential use situated on the mid-blocks to the north and south of Northern Boulevard. This is the historic development pattern for more than 60 years uh, from before the enactment of the zoning resolution in 1961 and the establishment of the current zoning. Here you can also see the irregular shape of the site. It has frontage on 58th and 60th streets and narrows to approximately 37 feet at uh, frontage at Northern Boulevard. It looks like we're being joined by, by Joe Voltaggio. Uh, the 52, uh, excuse me, 5,259 square foot site is shown here. I uh, was improved with a one story former restaurant building with unenclosed parking built around 1930. The restaurant closed about six years ago and the zoning rules prohibit the building from being reactivated with a new commercial use. The existing building is in disrepair 
and cannot feasibly be converted to accommodate a new productive conforming use. New housing within the R5 is unlikely due to the low density zoning, the small lot size, and its location along Northern Boulevard. So this uh, is a zoning change map uh, illustrating the existing zoning on the left-hand side of the screen and the proposed zoning on the right-hand side of the screen. The proposed rezoning to R6B C22 would allow an increase from the existing R5 zoning district FAR of 1.25 to the proposed R6B C22 zoning district FAR of 2.0 for commercial use or 2.2 for residential use with MIH. It also comes with an increase in the maximum building height from 40 feet under the R5 to 55 feet above a 45 foot base height and the proposed R6B C22. These increases in FAR and height are appropriate along a wide street like Northern Boulevard. Finally, the uh, proposed uh, actions would facilitate the development of a two-story automobile sales showroom building with approximately 8,000 square feet of commercial floor area, that's 1.52 FAR. The building would rise to a height of 21 feet and the, the proposed building is smaller than the permitted 2.0 because otherwise parking and loading requirements that cannot be accommodated on site would be triggered. Now, Joe, Mike, and John will briefly discuss uh, the concept of the showroom before turning it over to Nelly. General? Uh, thank you, Chair Grodnick and, uh, and commissioners. Now, the automobile landscape has changed. You know, Tesla has created a new business model. Um, it's impossible to find plots of land to, uh, to put automobile showrooms. You know, people need to see, touch, and feel the cars that they're buying. You know, Link is an American brand that's just celebrated its centennial, 100 years in business, an American brand competing against foreign brands, uh, creating a great product, is going all in on electric. Um, they, they're expecting a commitment from the dealerships to go all electric by 2030. 35% of their fleet should be by 2025 electric. And um, it's just important that this is an underrepresented area for this brand. And um, this is the perfect location for it. Thank you. Great. Uh, now, Nellie will just review the design and sustainability, and we're happy to answer any questions. Good morning, all. Uh, this site plan shows the footprint of the building. As you can sense the irregular shape of the site that creates design constraints. Also note that the zoning requires an eight-foot yard, but we've provided a 10-foot yard to accommodate the EV chargers. This uh, first floor plan shows the showroom, the interior, the exterior, driveways, and the EV charging stations. This partial second floor contains office space and is open to the first floor below. And lastly, uh, we are uh, proposing solar panels on the roof, given the uninterrupted access to light, and are also looking into a geopaved system for the side yard that will allow natural storm infiltration, reduces the runoff, and reduces the detention retention of water on the site. We're also considering uh, uh, asking DOT for approval of bioswales on the sidewalk, possibly the tree pits. Um, we have also considered reusable gray water for irrigation. And lastly, a green roof element using planting on the roof to reduce solar transmission. And I believe this concludes our presentation. Now, I'll just um, loop back on the, the EV chargers um, quickly, because I know that was mentioned at the review session. We're happy to answer further questions, but um, the goal is to provide uh, both um, uh, EV charging stations to customers and to the public. Um, two will be located in the unenclosed parking area at the rear of the site, and the others will be located actually in the building um, in an interior driveway. Um, this is something that, that we uh, heard from the community board and then also from the, the borough president that there's a demand for uh, EV in the, in the area. So the goal was to use what limited space we had on the site uh, to provide that accommodation. Um, we'll also note that, that we had been in touch initially with the Department of Transportation to participate in a pilot program they have uh, to install EV chargers on city streets. 
that program was not yet um, available in this area, but we'll continue to, to um, try and connect with, with DOT to make that happen here uh, to provide EV charging um, on, at the street uh, portion outside the property. Um, that concludes the presentation. And again, we're happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Before I turn to Vice Chair Knuckles and uh, Commissioner Dweck and others, uh, let me just ask if you could say a little bit more about um, the the paving opportunity. I think you refer to it as geo geopave, That's if I heard right. it correct. So, uh, and true. the bioswell opportunity and the tree planting. Those are recommendations all certainly we saw from the, the borough president and also I think in an area with a lot of asphalt. Um, these are welcome and important. So if you could just say a little bit more about those, where you are in those conversations, uh, it would be very helpful. We have started conversations. We have not finalized the design, but yes, we are considering all these measures. And tell us what you expect in terms of, was, did I have the, the, the term correctly on the paving? Yes, Geo, well, GeoPavers is one of the companies that... And what, and what exactly would it... Infiltration system, it allows for the water to seep into the ground at a slower rate. And you believe that you actually could accommodate that and do that on this site? On the, on the site, well, um, you know, we only have the site yard at this point in time, so that's what we're going to do on the site yard, yeah. And so that would be at the, the uh, exterior parking strip at the rear of the site. So the footprint of the building um, covers almost the entirety of the site. The, the, the sidewalk itself is a little uh, unusual. It sort of bulbs out on 58th Street. But that entire strip of uh, where the accessory parking is shown, um, that's about 10 feet by about 76 feet, um, could be paved with those permeable pavers um, to prevent the, the portion of the site that's that's um, uh, would not be improved with the building um, to uh, uh, work towards flood resiliency and sustainability. And the bioswells could be where? Um, so new street trees would, would be required in connection with the development of the site. They're shown here on the site plan. There's, there's three. Um, given the, some of the sidewalk infrastructure, um, there, there would not be uh, a tree on the 58th Street uh, uh, frontage of the site. Um, but working with the Department of Parks, um, we can request that those tree pits uh, also contain bioswales um, to, to further add to uh, flood resiliency. Um, also note that, that we're planning landscaping um, uh, as, as much as possible surrounding the site. Um, so to a much lesser degree, those planters could contribute to uh, flood resiliency measures. Thank you. Vice Chair Knuckles. Thank you. Um, at least this this uh, site plan would seem to indicate that you're, you're going to be very close to a, a pre-existing uh, residence, uh, residential building. I'm just wondering, uh, what do you think your hours of operation will be, basically? Sure, I can actually have the... Um, uh, Joe, do you want to answer that? Good morning. Sorry for being late. Um, the operations are different now during COVID. Uh, we're not open on Sundays, and our Ford and Lincoln store on the other side of Queens is open between nine and seven at night. So we've lowered our hours during COVID because there's more shopping done for automobiles during the week and uh, before the weekends are tend to be used for family, you know, now. So um, they, they people don't shop for cars on Sundays anymore. I just have a, a follow-up. I have a, a pressing land use question for, for Mr. Starks. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Starks. You, Thank you. You, uh, Look like you could play. Um, I wish. How optimistic are you about the Knicks this year? <laughs> As you can see, they look great. Uh, it's amazing what a, a point guard would do for you. And uh, having Jalen Brunson here, truly, uh, you can see, I already see the difference in the demeanor of the team. So it's uh, we're looking good right now. You know, we just have to keep it, keep it up. You know, defense, you know what I like. Right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair and colleagues, I just want to say, in, at least in my memory, Fred uh, Cerullo may remember this. Um, Mr. Starks is the second Nick to uh, testify before the Planning Commission. Um, I guess this was 15 years ago, Fred, when, the, when uh, Madison Square Garden Eight. lease was up yeah. for renewal. Larry Johnson yeah. came yeah. and testified. <laughs> and... Uh, Oh yeah, Dean. Yeah. Well, maybe he came to the council, but no, he, no, no. In the 80s, I was the board of 
Oh, at the 80s, in the 80s, well, okay, all right, all right, all right, I see, I see, I see to, I see to Gail on that, on that point, but um, I share your optimism. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I would say the support for the deck surely, uh, I think, would be within the scope <laughs> of the zoning resolution. That's a pertinent land use yeah. issue. Com <laughs> Commissioner Dweck. Um, just continuing along that line, I would uh, suggest one free throw from the line, and we could decide it right now. <laughs> um, going back to the, most of my questions on the charging uh, stations have been answered. Um, I guess I have a question. How long will charging a car take? And what is the traffic impact? Will there be uh, cars queuing up in the street? Uh, and is there a reservoir space for the for the cars that are waiting to, to charge? You know, I'm, I'm trying to understand the traffic that could cause. I mean, it's kind of a new gas station uh, charging station of the future. So, what are the impacts, and how are you going to deal with that? Sure. So that, that's a good question. I'll I'll note. Um, at the start that, um, you know, we prepared a, a full environmental assessment statement for, for the project um, and you know, did not find traffic impacts. The, the size um, and, you know, th this proposed uh, commercial use is similar to, you know, uh, other retail uses. So not, not expecting um, anything close to traffic impact or really um, noticeable traffic uh, in the area. With, with respect to the um, EV charging stations, um, really the, the goal here was to, to utilize as, as much of the space as possible. Um, we, we definitely got some tough questions with, with respect to the operations of the uh, EV chargers at, at the rear of the site. It's admittedly tight. Um, I, I think we'll say two things. that. We uh, know that we're likely going to need an attendant, uh, one of the staff members, um, to assist with uh, parking on site. Um, and the second is, is, you know, we're realizing that this is a bit of a, um, we're going to have to figure out operational concerns um, as they happen. Um, I think, you know, it, there is an awareness that, that you know, um, there is the potential for, you um, you know, more demand than can be accommodated on site. So we'll have to work that out uh, with the programming. The, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, we um, have started or we have been doing outreach to some of the immediate neighbors. Um, so while there, um, th there's, a, there's a general uh, request that the EV charging be provided, the more immediate neighbors um, have asked that, that we secure the site outside or the, that portion of the site outside of business hours. So um, I'll just show you. Um, my next question on the hours of operation, will I be able to charge or will the resident be able to charge their car? So it, I think our, our initial conception is that we would leave that, that, that rear um, uh, driveway open uh, so that charging could occur outside of business hours. Um, upon conversation with, with the immediate neighbors, um, they were concerned about creating an alleyway um, and quality of life issues. So we're showing here in this, this bottom right-hand slide um, that 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 area would be gated in the evening, um, maybe not this particular gate, but but secured in a manner so that it, it doesn't create issues for for neighboring property owners in terms of quality of life. Um, it, so I, I know that it's, it's a it's a long answer to the question to say we're we're not entirely sure how this is going to work. Um, you know, we'll get a, a certainly a, a gauge on demand when it's when it's there and have to work with. Um, you know, the, the operations within the showroom and then also with the community to make sure that it's not creating issues, um, you know, by, by trying to provide this benefit. Thank you. Can I answer, just say one thing? Oh, sure, sure. The, the, um, as far as our operations go, our vehicles will not need to be charged here. We have a service department in Jamaica. Trucks will not be, you know, we won't have trucks, you know, unloading cars in the middle of Northern Boulevard. We have them dropped off at our storage facility. They're prepped in Jamaica. We're going to have a level three charger. You ask how long it takes. If the, the newer cars that are coming out, it's the fastest is 18 minutes. It's a $300,000 investment for that charging system, a level two charger. So a full charge all day, it literally takes all day. But, um, you know, the technology is getting better. And then we're hoping with the application and the pilot study for uh, customers that we will have something available. But our cars won't need to be charged there. Thank you, Commissioner Kamani. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm shifting gears a little bit, um, but want to 
talk about one of the borough president's recommendation about the minimum 30% goal to include, include MWBE firms and hiring locally and then reporting back um, to the borough president and the community board as that goal is reached and just would like to hear your response to that and, and how you're thinking about it. Uh, absolutely. So this is a, um, a, a condition we've seen uh, the, the Queensborough president add to as a condition to, um, to several recommendations. Um, my office has, has worked with uh, the, the Queensborough president's office on uh, that that reporting. Um, the applicant team has has committed uh, to to achieving that goal. Um, we'll also note that uh, was it about twelve employees yeah, that would be. Yeah, uh, John, yeah. if you want to. Uh, Thank you. Well, uh, I have a dealership. Uh, over in uh, in Jamaica, Queens on Queens Boulevard, John Starks Kill, and right now we hire about what twelve, about twelve uh, uh, community uh, citizens uh, that are a part of uh, John Starks Kill, and we want to continue that uh, with this uh, new uh, dealership uh, here on Northern Boulevard. Uh, I think it's very important to me. If anybody know me, I'm about uh, the community itself and to be able to continue to hire from uh, where we're doing business at here in Queens, I think it's the number one goal uh, of our business. You are. Thank you, Commissioner Commissioner Gold, followed by Commissioner Osorio. Thank you. It's definitely um, an interesting use. I had a couple of questions there just to follow up on. The community board um, had concern about auto uses given you know pedestrian deaths in the area. And this seems to me, but I'll uh, allow you to enlighten us, to be different than your typical car dealership. It's more clearly a showroom. Um, but I guess it would be helpful to get some color on how you see that, given others that you've looked at. Is it one make of, of car or vehicle? Um, how often do the, do the models get changed? Basically trying to get a sense for how much activity there could be going in and out that could drive things. And the second, um, the second question I had is, is this something – would folks make appointments to come? Would you take walk-in traffic? What, are, what does that look like? So, uh, do, you, do you want to? Yeah, you, yeah go ahead. And I can I can jump in as needed. So I call it uh, this venture like an Apple store, basically. You know, you you go in there, you look at colors, you look at components, everything's on, you know, tablets and stuff, and then a lot of the the deliveries we're doing now are home and office. So. If, if you had three cars on the showroom floor, it tend to not maybe change that often because you always have a duplicate of that car that you put on the floor. And then at the end of the model years, you, you tend to change it for the new style and, and the new EVs that are coming out. Um, a lot of the, you know, Queens customers that we've gotten on the other side enjoy pickup and uh, delivery for service, for sales. And the fact that service is nowhere near this building, it's in Jamaica. And as far as sales goes, um, I, I believe right now at our, our Queen showroom, 40% of our deliveries are not even at the showroom anymore. They're at their home and office. Unfortunately, the, you know, New York State's trying to fight the broker bill uh, where car brokers are you know, in that space, but car dealers are really already in that space. And that, that's you know, trying to... You know, people, time is, uh, you know, they want their time. So they don't want to go to a store and actually have to go through the paperwork. Now we just do DocuSign, and it goes straight to their tablet or their phone. So, so uh, correct me, but by the dealer agreement, you'd probably be limited to one make, right? There'd be one type yes, of car correct. that would be in there. Yeah, I couldn't put a Ford store. And actually, Howard Coppell, who went on the, the borough call, um, is across the street. He's my competitor. I also call him a friend, um, but he has Ford across the street. I'd have a Lincoln uh, across the street with uh, with John and uh, Mike. And so, so it sounds like it'd be more the updating might happen, say, at the beginning of the model year. Yes, let's say correct. Got it. it um, all right, interesting. The one thing I guess I would just mention, you probably have looked at it, but uh, there is a similar setup uh, actually for high end cars on Park Avenue, where there's a showroom there. I think it was either Ferrari or Maserati. Yeah. And I've actually watched personally, they, they don't change the cars that much. So they've been Correct. very sensitive. And I guess when they do that, they do it at night. So yeah. that they're Correct. able to, so, so that would just be a mention that, you know, if one can do that at moments when there's less of pedestrian course. activity, that would make 
me so, a little more comfortable. Yeah, so what, what basically, when they came to me with this concept, they already had it in, in Newport Beach, and they had it in Scottsdale. So last summer, I, I landed in Phoenix at 116 degrees. We went straight to Scottsdale, and we saw it. It's in a, um, it's in a shopping center, the high-end shopping center, and it's got uh, condos above. And there's only three cars on the showroom floor, and you can't even get through the sidewalk because it's an actual outdoor shopping center. And I watched how they basically, you know, they didn't change the cars once like a year, like you said. And then I went to then, I drove to Palm Beach, uh, Newport Beach, and they had the same concept in an outdoor shopping mall where they had one or two cars in, and that's all it was. It was basically, you see TVs, you see colors, you see uh, equipment, and that's basically it. Got it. All right. So now I'm, I'm just going to recommend that you also take that trip and drive to Park Avenue and, <laughs> <I will. laughs> and 55th Street, I think. But yeah. take a look. But, oh, Thank perfect. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for the answers. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Commissioner Osorio. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation, and and thank you so much for your commitment to advancing the electrification of vehicles in the state. This is uh, necessary to be able to achieve statewide mandates, right? So I, I really appreciate that, and I appreciate you reflecting some of the concerns in the presentation. Um, I, I have a couple questions. The first question is: It sounds like the community board has considerable concerns about additional auto-related. Um, a businesses in the community, um, and I wanted to understand a little bit why you think that is, and, and how are you responding to that? Um, I think that uh, as I, as you think about the, the response, I wanted to also explain the spirit of the question, which is, you know, I'm concerned when I hear that we're focusing on selling more cars and not either servicing them in the neighborhood, or if we're talking about electric cars, not charging them in the neighborhood. Because as you said, you're then sort of like moving the problem to another community that is going to have to deal with the impact of that. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your response to the community concerns and how you're addressing it uh, so that we can understand, again, how, how do we uh, bring more cars into our streets but also have a plan, a long-term plan to make it sustainable down the road. I can, um, one of the things we're, we're signing up for is... Uh, there's a company out there right now that's working with the Greater New York Auto Deals Association, where I'm a board member, where we're going to, at our service department, where we're going to put most of these chargers, we'll probably have 15 chargers at, at the end of this. But what we're going to have to have is a, it's a seven by seven foot battery in our parking lot. And that battery, battery will be charged either by solar or only draw at night. So the power will be drawn at night, charge the battery, our charging stations will run off the battery during the day so it doesn't have an effect on the grid at all. So, the, so as far as the community in Jamaica, it should have no effect at all. One clarification question. Is that the, you're talking about the battery that you'll have in Jamaica. Can you talk a little bit about the battery that, the, that you will need in Northern Boulevard to connect the solar panels with the charging stations? Will that also be the case here? Will the solar that you, you plan to install a cover the energy required for the chargers? I mean, so, sorry for the confusion. So, um, the, uh, Mike was, was referencing the, the uh, Jamaica service station, as you noted. Um, that hasn't been determined yet how the, uh, the solar would interact with the EV charging stations here. I, I can just speak more, more broadly to the, the, your, your question. It, it's a good question. We were, we were um, you know, dismayed by by the the split vote we got at um, uh, community board two um, you know we recognize that their their um, recommendation for for disapproval was was really based on a, a policy concern about um, you know historic and future use of, of northern boulevard as, as this auto related corridor um, I, I think you know one one sort of guiding um, aspect of it that you know we we've thought all along and and um, you know, developing the land use rationale for this project is that th this site is 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 vacant, it's underutilized, and it's there's no chance of it being activated, um, or at least we don't believe. And, and history has shown that that uh, it's it's not likely to be activated uh, with a new use. Um, the, these owners are are looking to um, you know bring their business here, reactivate the site. 
Um, I, I don't believe we showed pictures of it, but it's, it's the buildings in considerable disrepair. So I, I think, you know, our, our, one of the, the, the guiding principles we had about the project was that it would um, uh, reactivate the site and, and you know, beautify uh, a, a pretty um, a site that's in, in, in disrepair. Um, one of the ways that, that uh, we initially responded to uh, the community board and, and several meetings with their land use committee um, was by uh, including the public EV chargers. Um, and, and we recognize that, you know, ideally there would be more, but, you know, we're working with, with the site constraints that we have. Um, you know, we, we, I think we can, you know, feasibly fit two in that, that rear parking area, which is, is um, we actually uh, widened and, and shrunk the footprint of the building uh, in order to, to make sure that there's sufficient room for vehicles to get in there and, and charge. Um, if we could fit some more in there, you know, certainly that, that will be a consideration. Um, but that was the, the, you know, the first response to the community prior to um, their, their vote to recommend dispro- disapproval. Um, I, I think one of the, the suggestions um, that, that the chair had made, and I, I believe that we had had in some discussion with uh, the, the Queensborough president, um, was to continue to engage with community board two, um, and you know, create an open conversation about, um, you know, what what benefit this. Uh, new business could bring, um, you know, again, with the recognition that there's, there's concern about um, the, the business itself that is, a, you know, a, a vehicle sales. Um, but, you know, it, 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 trying to, to um, I guess, soften that, that concern with uh, additional benefits. So it, at the risk of, of, of rambling on too much, I, I just wanted to um, note that, you know, the inclusion of the, the rooftop solar um, the EV charging stations, which have been part of the project for uh, for months and months now, and then you know a, a new commitment for these permeable pavers at, at the rear, um, and an additional sort of um, green measures. That that was that's our, our response to the community, and also the commitment to um, you know understanding that we need to be a good neighbor, continue to, to uh, be in contact with the community board, and, and listen to their their uh, concerns going forward. I just I wanted to answer your SUV question because that was brought up on the community board. You know, as we go electric, a lot of the vehicles will become smaller, and uh, they're not going to be the, the larger vehicles. But the shift in market the last couple of years from, you know, cars to SUVs, all the manufacturers switched over and started building a lot more SUVs. And we're, you know, of course, just the selling person, not the builder. So, you know, we're a franchisee. So one of the, um, their com- um, concerns was that we'd be selling more larger SUVs in the community. Um, to be honest with you, the shift I've seen it happen uh, to smaller EV vehicles like the Mach-E, like the uh, Corsair uh, EV, um, just because that's what, you know, is what people want right now. The, the volume of sales in that segment of the Navigator is, is actually is only by order right now. There's no stock navigators at my facility right now. Uh, we have two in stock, and they already have deposits. They're mostly order to deliver, and people order them, and then, you know, and that's what they get. As far as on, you know, so I see the shift, and I understand the concerns, but unfortunately, I'm the franchisee and not the manufacturer. I see where they're coming from, and I have two kids myself, and I understand that, you know, you know. Having more cars on on Queen Streets is an issue, but unfortunately, I'm I, I, I'm doing as much as I can for the community. Is there time for a follow up question? Uh, thank you so much for your responses. I I really appreciate them, and as I said earlier, you know, I I believe that we New York State requires a, a private sector that is activated to address right. these concerns together. So I really appreciate right. them. To pivot to the second question, which is partially or very much related to what you just said. I just think that the land use rationale for the project sh- should respond to sustainability and climate change goals, not to what the market is asking yeah. for, ne- the, of automobiles asking for, which I think you, you, you've yeah. acknowledged as well. And so, I guess my question is, you also mentioned in the presentation that there's a considerable ecology of businesses in the area that are servicing automobiles. 
those workers, for the most part, rely on the combustion engine, and you are introducing a new type of technology. You're uh, supporting it, right? And so I'm wondering to what extent can the project also sort of incorporate or connect to that? As part of your rationale, your response to the community, community's concerns, it would be interesting from an economic development point of view to show how this new land use proposal could actually support uh, a, a potential servicing and charging as an economic development opportunity for the community in the site, which you're, you're sort of beginning to highlight or hint with the chargers. But I think that saying that we're going to have chargers a, not fully addressing earlier questions in terms of, you know, what are the impacts? What is the impact that that's going to have? And having, well, you have the opportunity to solve that with a, with a site um, a, a development plan, which could potentially accommodate that, I think would be an interesting question. And to build on that or to maybe uh, expand or illustrate another aspect of this question, you know, I think that I wanted to build on, on Chair Grotnick's first question and, and, and express also sort of like um, uh, the concern that your renderings are not speaking about sort of the pavement opportunities that you describe. Uh, it looks like a lot of concrete. Um, so I appreciate sort of the explanation that you gave, but at the same time, I'm wondering if permeability inside the lot is necessarily mutually exclusive from having those charging stations inside and actually sort of like maybe mediating where you want to have that passive landscaping to have permeability in places where you can allow to do it. Because one of the other concerns that I have is what happens when you have permeable surfaces and all of a sudden you have battery fluids and things entering the water stream? So what is the sort of like longer term plan for some of that too? Sure. If I could just um, answer a couple of things. I, I, I appreciate the, the, the question and, and the, the concept of um, this, this new business integrating into an existing system of, or an existing uh, landscape of, you know, historic automobile use along this corridor. Um, the one aspect, and bringing it back to zoning, is we're asking for a C22 overlay, which limits the use to the sales. We can have an auto showroom. We cannot have repairs. So servicing is, is just not permitted at this facility. So it, it, it limits the ability to do much more beyond uh, add these chargers. Um, we think that that's we, we think that, that providing these public chargers is again limited by the, the site constraints um, it is a real benefit. It, it's something that um, came out of discussion with the community board. Um, again, we were discouraged that at the end we didn't get their vote. Um, but I, I think that that's you know we're, we're just not in a position with the zoning we're seeking um, to do something much more. Uh, comprehensive in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, servicing the electric vehicles. That said, um, you know, all these gentlemen are Queens auto dealers that have multiple locations um, that can start to think about that in a, in a, in a more broad sense. Um, to your point about permeable pavers, it's, it's not shown on the plan because, frankly, it's, it's, it's not that interesting in the context of the buildings in terms of depicting it. Um, we can certainly provide that plan. Uh, showing the portion of the site that is not improved with the building, having those pavers, and some detail about you know what benefit they offer. All this concrete you're seeing on on the uh, rendering is is actually city sidewalk, which uh, unfortunately we have no control over. At some point in the future, you know we we hope that the city will move towards you know more sustainable sidewalks um, that would you know make a huge difference in terms of. Uh, Certainly, resiliency, um, sustainability, but uh, you know, I wish these these renderings didn't show that much concrete. But because it's it's not in our control, what we can control is is the plantings, uh, the rooftop space, um, and the, the the portion at the rear. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to move on to some public testimony. Thank you. Let me just uh, pull it up. And we're going to hear from, uh, we have three people uh, signed up to testify, starting with Laura Shepard. Um, Ms. Shepard, uh, when you are ready, you have three minutes. Welcome. Uh, this is a remote 
remote testimony. So I'm going to set you up, and as soon as you're ready, go right ahead. Sorry, was I called on to go first? Yes, is that you, Laura Shepard? Yes, that's me. Okay, go. yep, we got you. We can hear you. Go right ahead. Great. I strongly oppose the ULERP application for a Lincoln dealership at 5802 Northern Boulevard and urge you to support Community Board 2's resolution. I'm a Woodside resident and member of CB2, though I'm speaking as an individual. Alternative public, residential, or commu commercial uses that would better serve community needs were not seriously considered. The applicant may feel this is an ideal location to expand their brand, but their business and products are inappropriate, unnecessary, and unwelcome here. The applicant failed to identify an appropriately zoned lot where they could proceed as of right, and they are not entitled to expand the footprint of the auto industry in New York City, where the majority of residents do not even drive. Western Queens has ample public transportation options and is striving to become more walkable and bikeable. However, we suffer from high rates of traffic violence, and Northern Boulevard is a Vision Zero priority corridor. Since January 2015, 995 road users were injured and one killed west of the BQE, east of the BQE, several children and seniors have been killed. Climate change impacts all of us and the products this business seeks to sell, exclusively SUVs, will contribute significantly to emissions, uh, emissions and pollution. Lincoln's current fleet typically averages under, well under 30 miles per gallon and under 25 in cities. While gas prices are as high as $5 per gallon, vehicles that get 16 miles per gallon in New York City are unconscionably wasteful and unsustainable. Lincoln's intent to convert to EVs by 2030 is too slow and inadequate, given that there are 416 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere now, and we are already feeling the impacts. The also, the emissions benefits of EVs are largely obliterated when they are heavy SUVs. As regulations are eventually phased into tax vehicles by weight, and given that the franchisee cannot hold the manufacturer accountable for its fleet, this business is likely to fail. Lincoln's fleet, which consists exclusively of SUVs, are significantly more likely to harm cyclists than pedestrians and eight times more likely to kill children who are struck than sedans. In fact, 13 of the 16 children killed in New York City so far in 2022 were killed by SUVs, pickup trucks, vans, or school buses. 5802 Northern Boulevard is one block from an elementary school, PS 152, and several other neighborhood schools, including a yet to open 3000 seat high school on 54th Street. Children and families walking to school should not have to contend with vehicles driving or parked on the sidewalks as Lincoln operates its Jamaica location. You can take a look. The auto industry has an enormous footprint in New York City, where the, most of us don't drive, and the existing auto businesses along the Northern Boulevard corridor have historically been bad neighbors and racked up large numbers of complaints. Uh, this is poor land use, which endangers and discourages pedestrians while encouraging drivers to speak uh, to speed through. This rezoning will harm my neighbors and our cities with no meaningful benefits that cannot be realized as of right or by another applicant for just about any use. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shepard. We appreciate your testimony. We're going to move on to Riley Owens. Thank you very much. Riley Owens for three minutes. Hello, uh, everybody. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to talk. Uh, I am a resident of Woodside. I live a few blocks away from this site. I'm also a member of Community Board 2, but I represent myself today. Um, I am opposed to this uh, site development because of uh, the fact that it is a residential zone. It is not a commercial zone. We need more housing in this part of Queens and we need fewer car dealerships and uh, car shops. Um, as a father of two young children, my every day is fraught with danger at every crossing, on every sidewalk, in every street, as I get my children to school in this neighborhood, as I walk us to parks in this neighborhood, as I walk or bike anywhere in this neighborhood. And the reason is because this neighborhood is too accommodating to vehicles, to cars, and especially SUVs. <clears throat> You've addressed things about how the future of the industry is changing, but the future of New York is changing towards more bikes and pedestrianization. Uh, so to put in a car dealership now is to create a business at the end of an era. You're going to sell vehicles that no longer fit on city streets and are going to 
uh, conflict with uh, the future of the city. The future of the city is happening right now, even in this area where protected bike lanes are being built. Um, so I am very opposed to this project. It is not a zone for uh, a car dealership. It should be built for residential. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, for being here today. We're moving on to uh, Rosamond Yanutsos. For three minutes. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Rosamond Yanutsos. I too am a member of Community Board 2, but here speaking only on my own behalf, uh, I am a very local resident to this. I live on, on uh, 52nd Street, uh, this proposed development. And I agree with the comments previously mentioned, but would reinforce the impact of these kinds of vehicles in relation to climate change. I think it, it, their efforts to uh, put in electric chargers and solar panels, it's just an instance of greenwashing. Uh, it, uh, it, it does not uh, actually, the more significant thing is promoting a kind of business that we don't want in our community. There's plenty of places where car dealerships can thrive, and, uh, but not, not here. And these large vehicles that they will be selling have proven themselves to be very dangerous, as Ms. Shepard was uh, saying. Um, and in particular, I would like to mention that uh, they one, one model that they are planning to sell, as they told me on, at the meeting with the community board, is comparable to the vehicle that killed one of our community members on 48th Street, um, uh, very close by <clears throat> on just off of Northern Boulevard. And uh, we um, really are opposed. I particularly would dispute the developers um, shirking their responsibility by saying these are the vehicles that the manufacturers make. This is just as makes just as much sense as a gun dealer uh, saying, I'm not responsible for these, uh, you know, AR-15s that I'm selling. They're the ones that people want and the ones that the manufacturers are building. Uh, we can do better than this. And, and we really do not want to, we have enough dealerships as well, already, as has been mentioned, many of these developers own multiple dealerships, but uh, let them go where um, it, where they're wanted and not in our community. I thank you for your attention and urge you to oppose this, um, this zoning rezoning uh, request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that is the last uh, person signed up to testify on this item. I'm going to do a final call, see if uh, we have missed anybody. Um, doing a final check. Seeing none, uh, we will close the hearing on uh, this item, 5802 Northern Boulevard rezoning, and we are going to open the hearing on our third public hearing item. Madam Secretary, please uh, introduce this item. Burr of Queens, calendar number 12, 9727 57th Avenue Commercial Overlay. CD4 C220250 ZMQ public hearing in the matter of an application for zoning map amendment concerning 97 27 57th Avenue commercial overlay. Excellent. Thank you. We have an applicant team uh, which consists of Patrick Taylor, David West, and Sung Kim. Um, and uh, so go ahead. Whenever you are ready, you have uh, 10 minutes. market at 9727 57th Avenue will discuss the proposed changes to the store. And finally, David West from Hill West Architects will show the contemplated building massing. And I am <coughs> sorry we didn't bring any Nicks with us. Um, <laughs> oh, that's not it. We forgive you for that. 
How do I go to the next slide? There we go. <laughs> this is an application to facilitate the expansion and modernization of the supermarket at the site by mapping a C24 commercial overlay over the entire property while leaving the existing underlying R6A and R6B zoning in place. The property is owned by Bogapa Service Corp, who operate the Food Bazaar chain of supermarkets across the tri-state area. The supermarket has been in the neighborhood for nearly 60 years, and Bogapa would like to rebuild it with a larger, more modern supermarket. 9727 57th Avenue is in the Corona neighborhood of Queens and occupies the block front on the north side of 57th Avenue between 97th Place and 98th Street. It's located just north of Lefrak City and near a number of shopping centers. It's fairly well served by transit, with several bus lines running along 57th Avenue that stop directly adjacent to the site and the Woodhaven Boulevard MR subway station, approximately half a mile to the southwest. The supermarket was built in 1962 pursuant to a BSA variance that had a 25 year term. The variance was required because the site was entirely in an R6 district in which no commercial uses are permitted. The site has approximately 34,000 square feet of lot area. The 20,000 square foot portion of the site that's within 100 feet of 57th Avenue is now zoned in an R6A district with the C12 commercial overlay, and the remaining 14,000 square feet beyond 100 feet of 57th are in an R6B district with no commercial overlay. Accordingly, while a commercial overlay was established for a portion of the site after the BSA's grant, the variances remained necessary for the portion of the supermarket that is within the R6B portion of the site beyond the overlay. Because of the term limit for the variance, it has had to be extended numerous times, and it's currently set to expire in less than five years. This application proposes to establish a new C24 commercial overlay over the entire property, while leaving the existing R6A and R6B zoning districts in place. This will enable a new, larger supermarket to be built without obtaining an amendment to the BSA variance. Since the property is built to well below its maximum permitted floor area of a little over 88,000 square feet, the owner determined that a new development on the property with an expanded supermarket should also utilize the property's permitted floor area by providing residential units above the new supermarket. The existing store was built almost 60 years ago and has old and inefficient fixtures and mechanical systems. The store has got, undergone very minimal updates since it was built. The supermarket has an open parking area along 98th Street with 21 open parking spaces and an open loading area. The trash is also located within the unenclosed loading dock area. The one-story supermarket's existing floor plate is about 22,000 square feet, about a quarter of which is back of house and storage space. The current surface parking lots configuration, which you can see in this existing ground floor plan, contributes to the congestion at the intersection of 57th Avenue and 98th Street, which the community board raised as a concern. Customer vehicles currently enter the, super, the surface parking lot on 57th Avenue, immediately adjacent to an existing bus stop and near the corner with 98th Street. 57th and 98th are both two-way streets. Vehicles exit on 98th using the same curb cut that delivery trucks utilize to access the loading area. So now I'll turn it over to Patrick to discuss the proposed project and the layout changes to the store that take these issues into account. Okay, thank you and good morning, Chair Grodnick and commissioners. My name is Patrick Taylor. I'm the Vice President of Real Estate Investments at Shored Real Estate Group. Uh, Shored has previously worked with Bogopa to renovate food bazaar stores in Jackson Heights and Bed-Stuy uh, as part of mixed-use developments. This application would similarly allow Food Bazaar to have an expanded and modernized store at their 57th Avenue location. <clears throat> In keeping with the newer stores, <clears throat> a renovated store here will have a larger product selection, particularly for fresh produce, meat, and seafood, more energy efficient fixtures, and improved waste management systems. The images on the screen here are from a recently constructed food bazaar at Bronx Terminal Market. The expanded store will increase sales floor area by 5,000 square feet. The project would also add over 8,000 square feet of back of house space in the cellar, nearly doubling the existing storage capacity. The loading area and parking would both be enclosed and 46 supermarket parking spaces would be provided in the cellar, more than double the 21 existing spaces. 
In reviewing the ground floor plan, <clears throat> the main supermarket entrances are on 57th Avenue, with the residential entrance on 98th Street. Loading and trash would be on 98th Street near their existing location, but would be enclosed and accommodate loading berths for two trucks rather than one. Access to the supermarket parking in the cellar would be moved to 97th place and be nearly 160 feet from the corner. We think that moving the parking entrance off 57th and away from the bus stop will ease congestion at the busy corner of 57th and 98th and improve pedestrian safety by having no vehicle entrance near the bus stop. Separating the supermarket parking from the loading dock will also prevent backups caused by conflicts between delivery trucks and customer vehicles. Bogopa have told us they expect the number of truck deliveries will be significantly reduced due to the increased storage space at the site, though incidences of trucks blocking the street while turning would also be reduced. The residential parking garage would be on the second floor with its entrance and exit on 98th Street in the current location of the supermarket parking exit. Since residential vehicle trips would be much less frequent than supermarket trips, we think this change will also help congestion issues on 98th Street. Based on feedback that we received from CB4's Land Use Committee, we made changes to the plans to increase the number of supermarket accessory parking spaces. While our filed application showed 25 spaces, we now propose to excavate the entire cellar level and increase the number of supermarket parking spaces to 46. Accordingly, while the, sale, the size of the sales floor in the supermarket is increasing by about 30%, the number of supermarket parking spaces will increase by about 120%. The garage would be self-park and free to supermarket customers. And uh, David West will now talk about the architecture. <coughs> Good morning, Chair Garadnik and Commissioners. I'm David West from Hill West Architects. Uh, these next images show the existing one-story building in context and the adjacent residential developments from the northeast and the southwest. Yeah, I got it, David. Okay. So there were three of these images. Yep. I think we can go on. Yeah. All right. Um, to provide additional context for the application, we prepared an illustrative massing for the as of right building that would be developed. The building would comply with all floor area and bulk requirements within the existing R6A and R6B zoning districts, which are not affected by the proposed commercial overlay expansion. Can we go on to an image of the building? Within the R6A portion, the building would rise four stories before setting back the required 10 feet from 57th Avenue and 15 feet from the side streets, other than permitted dormers, before rising to a maximum permitted height of 75 feet. Next slide. Within the R6B portion, the building may rise to a maximum base height of 45 feet before setback and a maximum height of 55 feet. We anticipate that within the R6B on 98th Street, the building would rise three stories before setting back 15 feet and rising an additional story to the maximum height of 55 feet. And on 97th place within the R6B, the building would only rise two stories. Next slide. The development would utilize the site's maximum permitted floor area of about 88,400 square feet, about 26,400 square feet of which would be commercial floor area, not including the cellar, and the rest which would be residential above with 78 dwelling units. In addition to the supermarket parking in the cellar, the building would have approximately 45 residential accessory parking spaces on the second floor of the building equal to approximately 60% of the units. Bicycle parking would be provided for each garage as required by zoning, five bicycle parking spaces for the supermarket garage and 39 bicycle spaces in the residential garage for the 78 dwelling units. Thank you for your attention and we're happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much.
questions from Commissioner Buzzorg. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm curious um, how you're considering the recommendation from the borough president and I believe the community board as well around um, including a commitment to um, affordable units as part of the housing program. Patrick can address that. Um, sure, thank you. Um, so, you know, as you know, this is an upzoning for additional density, so we cannot map MIH on the site. Um, the original intention for development here was to provide affordable housing um, via the uh, property tax abatement 421A, which, as you all probably know, has sunset as of June with no immediate replacement. Um, <clears throat> Given the expiration of the tax abatement, um, we don't feel that the residential component of this project is feasible at this time. And um, as such, there is no plan to you know, deliver an only market rate building. Um, rather, the intention is to build a mixed use residential building with a supermarket upon uh, the reintroduction of a tax abatement that includes affordable housing requirements. So you're you're holding off on the residential component until you understand what the future of 421A is, or I mean, have you thought about even trying to pencil in 25% or some other you know synthetic MIH like as we've seen in some other projects? Um, is that something you've looked at? Sure. Yeah, we have looked at it, and in fact. We've even looked at a market rate development without the tax abatement, which in and of itself we feel is not feasible um, or able to obtain financing here. So we have explored different scenarios. Um, and regardless of the, um, <clears throat> you know, the fate of 421A, um, this project isn't slated for, you know, immediate redevelopment. Um, you know, the owners of the supermarket, um, you know, or anticipating a redevelopment time frame here that's, you know, two to three years away from now. So um, it's not an unreasonable, I think, expectation to hope, hope that there's uh, additional affordable housing programs in place that would help us to deliver that. And is the owner at all interested in exploring a fully affordable project with HPD? Um, yes, they are open to it. Um, we. I think back about over a year ago, I did bring this project to HPD. Um, at the time, they were wrapping up their pipeline over the old administration. Um, but it's a it's a conversation that um, we would be happy to have at HPD as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dwight. Thank you. Maybe you could walk us through the uh, thought process and background on how you came to the conclusion just to maintain the current zoning and not seek an upzoning. Uh, was that something that was on your mind and was turned down by planning? Uh, because looking at it from my perspective, certainly contextually, I could see this property ripe for an upzoning, which would then trigger MIH, which would allay a lot of the concerns um, on the commission from the commission. So maybe you can walk us through how you came about the idea of maintaining the current zoning. Was it an end run around triggering MIH, or was it something that was just not feasible? So. Please, if you could speak to that. I'd... Uh, yeah, great question. And, uh, you know, we workshopped a lot of iterations at the um, beginning of this project and, and also consulted with, you know, both the community board and council member here, um, both of which were opposed to added density. Um, you know, from my seat, um, you know, as a developer, I was pretty much agnostic, you know, toward, you know, we, we, we prefer the uh, upzoning for affordable housing, but um, due to other um, uh, preferences and, and needs of the community, there was uh, a desire uh, for for not an increased height and not an increased density, um, and so so that's how uh, this project you know has come to come down this path. I'll just add that um, in consultation with city planning staff, we we consulted with the commission uh, the council member very early in this process. Um, I think before we even submitted a pre-application statement and got initial feedback that um, a rezoning, uh, an upzoning would not be welcome here, but that we got positive feedback about the expansion of the supermarket itself, 
um, you know, we've gotten the same same feedback, um, you know, asking again. Um, and I, I think some of the community's concerns here are the existing congestion at this site, um, which is why we've added the additional parking, um, you know, after, in, in addition to what was shown in the filed application um, in, in response to some of those concerns. So I think, I, I don't know that the community was concerned about about the height and how the buildings would look, but mostly concerned about um, the, the congestion issues and that a, an upzoning would add um, more congestion at a site that has, you know, some existing issues, some of which are, you know, are exacerbated by the existing conditions of the supermarket's parking lot. So your your decision was based in deference to the community board and council member. It was it was based on what what we thought an approvable rezoning at this site would that be. Shed, that sheds a lot of light. Thank you very much. And if, when you think about this site, separate and apart from the the political environment, and you you think about context, and you think about zoning that you think would be appropriate here, uh, or number of units that could be included here, what do you envision uh, for the, what would you have envisioned for this site separate and apart from uh, the political reality that you are facing? David might be able to speak to that a bit, but. Well, look, we, we looked at a variety of densities on this site and we looked at, uh, I, I think R7A was a density that was considered, but again, as we uh, have explained to you, that uh, was pretty well eliminated as an opportunity early on in the process, and we settled on focusing on making sure the supermarket could be built uh, without a variance. Yeah, and as you can see in this context view, you know, there's certainly density to the south at Left Rack City, but it steps down quite quickly, and, you know, we do think that the existing R R6A R6A to R6B transition zoning is pretty appropriate um, for the way that the neighborhood changes quite quickly from the south to the north. Just, just for clarification here, when you say that the R7A was pretty quickly eliminated, it was eliminated through your conversations in the, and political conversations with elected leaders locally. Is that is that what? I just want to make sure because city planning. Uh, I don't. I just want to make sure that it was not city planning not, who was guiding you there. It was not city planning. It was the local elected officials. Yeah. Commissioner Dweck. Uh, follow up on the, on the fresh, uh, on the market. Uh, are you going to be taking advantage of any fresh uh, tax incentives or any benefits and so forth? Yes. So uh, when we started this project, um, this, uh, this site was not actually located in a fresh zoning district. Um, that has since been expanded and it now is. Um, when you say fresh zoning district, you mean for um, zoning bonus or for, for zoning bonus or for the financial incentives? Both. Both. Excuse yeah, me. well, it, it, it was in, in financial incentive. It was not in zoning Got previously. <clears throat> um, but, yes, um, uh, especially for uh, the financial incentive, um, this user um, would take advantage of that. I have to say in, in um, our previous mixed-use project with this very similar profile development, um, the, the, the 421A tax abatement um, supersedes the, the fresh tax abatement. Um, however, the, the remainder of the financial incentives, includes the sales tax, uh, would be utilized. And, and just to follow up, um, my colleague on uh, Monday's review, uh, review session noted uh, about uh, below grade use of uh, the supermarket for sales. Are you going to be utilizing that? Um, and not necessarily specific to this project, but I just in, in general. Um, yeah. Sure, if I understand the question correctly, this, this project has 8,000 square feet below grade. Uh, for the supermarket, it's not sales floor area. It's only storage, back of house, prep, things like that. Got it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner Rampershed. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Just a quick question with regards to deliveries. Will there be a restriction on time? Because, you know, I know with supermarkets, my mom worked for one for 37 years, so I know there's deliveries throughout the day from different from meats to goods. How are you going to control that? Because I do understand the community's concern with the traffic congestion. I know the area very well, and I see it. Uh, how do you propose to deal with that? Um, sure. Uh, I mean, 
we think the revised ground floor circulation um, will help existing condition, where, whereas now your supermarket parking customers as well as your deliveries share a curb cut. There'll be, frankly, just more space, period. Uh, there'll be a larger loading dock. Um, and to answer your question, um, the supermarket um, typically takes deliveries uh, from about 7 a.m. to about 1 p.m. Thank you. Mr. Gold? Sorry, so just to go back to something um, that you said earlier. So we, how do you think about the future then if, you know, the this gets approved? Um, do you expand the supermarket or do you stand by uh, to see what happens with 421A before you do the broader project? Um, that's a good question, um, and, and that's a business decision that will largely be made by the supermarket owner. They own the they own the site, the real estate, and they also operate the supermarket. This is one of the stores that's the oldest in their portfolio, and, and they represented to me a desperate need for renovation. So, you know, if, if they feel like that's needed um, to accelerate the, the redevelopment so that they can upgrade their supermarket and provide service to the customers in the area that they want to, um, you know, they, would, they may go down that road. But um, my best guess is that this will happen, you know, three to five years when, when we can do a conceivable uh, mixed-use development. Got it. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner Osorio. Thanks so much for the presentation. I, I had a quick question uh, regarding the Borough President's uh, recommendation about porous concrete in all outdoor parking areas. Can you, can you uh, explain a little bit your response to that and, and, and to what extent your site design reflects some of this, these priorities? Well, the, the proposed building design covers the entire site, so there's not an opportunity for permeable paving, but it has a very good roofscape. Um, so we've, we've considered resiliency measures. We, we understand there have been some flash precipitation events in the neighborhood, which have raised concerns. Further study is needed, but we... Uh, to our understanding, the existing store has never flooded, but we would employ best practices to mitigate flash precipitation events. Among the measures under consideration would be green roof or blue roof, an oversized detention tank, elevation of RPC valve to the ground floor rather than the cellar, possibility of a raised entry to the below-grade garage, uh, locating doors at the highest elevation, and I'll note the uh, entrance to the garage ramp that serves the cellar parking facility is located at the highest point on the site, approximately three feet higher than the lowest point on the site. Uh, we would consider locating the residential mechanical above grade to the extent feasible, put backwater valves on the sewer system, and have some pumps on standby power uh, those are primarily resiliency measures. Uh, sustainability measures would probably include the building being all electric or nearly so, having a highly efficient envelope, and using the rooftops for both green roofs and solar arrays. Um, so I think we're we're thinking about these things. Thank you for for the the response. I, I would just encourage you to think about whether you can allocate for additional uh, uh, permal surfaces on, on whether the occupation could allow for uh, the inclusion of that. And I specifically encourage you to think about the recommendation from the borough president about passive natural landscaping. Well, certainly on the roofs, we would have ample landscaping, and that always serves uh, a stormwater retention to, uh, purpose as well as other purposes. And the sidewalks or we put in street trees, we would employ the latest uh, version of bioswale or large tree pit, uh, which, you know, has, hasn't been fully explored yet from our point of view, but these are things we're doing on every project. Thank Certainly you. would look to do here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Well, thank you all very much uh, for your presence here today and for uh, your uh, for your time and also interest in investing in New York City. So we thank you for that. Um, let me note that we do not have members of the public who are
here to testify on this item. So I'm just going to give a quick final call here. Okay. Seeing uh, nobody, we'll close the hearing on this item. Uh, Madam Secretary, I will ask you if there's any other business before the commission today. No, Chair Grodnick, there is no other business before the commission today, but I do have some public information to share. For those of you who are unable to or did not wish to testify, you can submit written testimony online by selecting this hearing on the upcoming meeting page of the NYC Engage portal through DCP's website or by mailing your comments to City Planning Commission, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271, uh, calendar information office, attention. Excellent. Thank you. And let me just uh, thank uh, the commissioners who are present today. As always, we appreciate your, your time and engagement. And, of course, the staff of the Department of City Planning uh, for prepare, preparing us so ably and helping to uh, navigate these uh, applications through the process. Uh, thanks to all. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The time is 11.46 a.m.